All right. So pleased to have uh, these wonderful guests here tonight. I'm David Carroll with the Nevada County Tech Connection. This is Tectonic TV. This is our remote working panel. We've got with us tonight, Robert Trent, the Executive Director of Sierra Commons. Robert has been consulting with Nevada County businesses for almost 20 years. As the founder and executive director of Sierra Commons, Robert has consulted with and taught hundreds of entrepreneurs. Uh, you may be familiar with the Business Igniter program. And he was also the executive director of my employer, the Nevada County Economic Resource Council. We're joined also by Ken Kugler. Ken is the founder of Scale Unlimited, a provider of consulting and training services for big data analytics, search, and web mining. Previously, he was the founder and CTO of Krugel, the VC-backed vertical search engine enterprise appliance for code and technical information. Ken's joining our panel uh, largely because he has not been in an office since uh, he told me the year, but I'm not even going to attempt to remember. 1986. There, there you go. Uh, our final panelist is Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson is a software engineer and certified gyrokinesis instructor, the BS in computer engineering and a BA in dance, uh, two kind of polar opposites. Um, with her ability to solve problems, she takes on many of life's problems with a willing attitude. Now, we're here to and talk- What's, what's about the cat's the name, Danielle? This yeah. is Charlie. He Char likes to and Charlie's the time I'm on a headset, he likes to be part of a meeting. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. I think this is one of the benefits of remote working. You know, we all love our pets and uh, both distracting and wonderful to have them, uh, have them there with us. Um, other benefits, uh, you know, this is, uh, I'd like to turn to Robert here to have him talk a little bit about non-obvious benefits of remote work besides the fact that, you know, you can have, you know, a business shirt and uh, the same pants uh, five days of the week. Yeah, cool. I mean, it's it's so funny that um, you know I've been dancing around this issue for a while, and even um, have gotten grants to help promote remote work. Uh, one of the one of the reasons, and one of the kind of the uh, was one of the grants was through the Northern Sierra Air Quality Management District, and what we said was, hey, let's stop people from driving to Roseville and Rockland. And uh, it's much better for the environment. It's much better for, um, you know, who wants to be in a car all day, the traffic. Um, and then when people work locally here, um, they spend their money here. And so that, there's a great, you know, helping our local economic ecosystem is awesome. Um, and that grant was written pre-COVID and part of it was like to do, you know, to give people the tools needed to convince their boss to let them remote work. Well, <laughs> the job got a lot easier with COVID, right? You know, um, and school and people just juggling, there's a, just a huge shift. And so uh, remote work, working from home is um, just where it's at. Why um, drive and why sit in a big office? Um, you know, I, I do miss coworkers, you know, sometimes if, if I'm not in an office environment and there is some social aspect to it. And I think that one of the exciting things about right now is that we get to invent this or reinvent the water cooler conversations and the social conversations. And actually as, as uh, being in the startup world, what a great business opportunity, uh, you know, to help social engagement today in a remote working world. Um, you know, people are clearly Zoom, burned out on Zoom. There's gotta be some um, alternative ways to keep that social aspect going. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity. And besides you get your cat in your lap and you get to eat, make your sandwich when you want and get to, you know, if you can, shift time and sleep in or get to your circadian rhythm. Awesome. 
there's so many benefits. It's good for the environment. Uh, it's good for productivity. I know we'll be talking about productivity later. And Sierra Commons is a co-working space. So we're designed for remote workers. We have startup businesses and um, a lot of solopreneur, entrepreneur, remote workers that um, like the discipline of coming into an office space. Um, some people, when they work from home, they, they just have, okay, that is the office and that's where work is. But other people have, you know, on their kitchen table is their stacks of paper and it's hard to separate things. So um, CR Commons and co-working is a nice balance between uh, remote working and office working where there's um, a lot of peer mentoring. Um, so it's not just the community and uh, interaction with people. It's like, ah, oh, Ken stand late. Oh, Ken just downloaded this, tried this new software and tried that out. He loves it. I trust Ken. I'm going to try that. I'm going to learn from that. Um, so there is something to be said for interaction, personal interaction. And I just think it's an exciting time now to reinvent how we spend our day. Thanks, Robert. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's shift over to Ken here a little bit. He's got a, a very nice looking home office right there. Speaking of home offices. <laughs> yeah, you kind of you kind of need that separate for me. I need that separate space. Uh, I, I actually was at CR Commons when I didn't have like a, a home office because you just go kind of crazy or I go kind of crazy. Um, I have a friend who didn't have a home office and his technique was every day he'd get up and he'd put on a suit and tie. Like, and, and he had a desk in his bedroom and he'd sit down at the desk and he'd work. And then at 5.30, he'd take off the suit and tie and get a beer. And that was his way of sort of creating a boundary between the two, because otherwise it all blurs together. Um, you know, having a nice home office or having a place to go is, is pretty, I found it's pretty critical to create separation because otherwise it's just all one big mass of work and life and everything and it's not good yeah. um yep that's uh is that the voice of experience or has that been oh yes yeah. no that's that's uh i mean working remote has been great because i've been able to live you know japan and hong kong and you know i could move here i could uh, you know it's it's uh it's sort of like on the internet nobody knows you're a dog well, if you're, it's kind of like if you're working remote and you can deal with time zone issues, you can kind of work anywhere. Um, there definitely is some skill to working remote. Uh, I had an engagement, my company did with Citibank, which is the epitome of a big company where everybody comes in the office. And then when COVID happened, everybody had to work remote. Uh, and like the first month was chaos because nobody knew how to do it. Like it was just, it was like, I felt like I was giving classes to people on here's how you work remote. Like, you know, <laughs> cause yeah, it was, it was bad. Um, to me, uh, you know, over the years, it's definitely got easier, you know, just, you know, yes, even though there is zoom fatigue, oh my God, it's so much better than every, you know, like than everything before it. Um, but given all of the different ways you can communicate, one of the things I've found it, it really helps to be is be able to block off everything. Like I don't use it, but friends of mine use software like on the Mac, you can just say quiet mode and it basically mutes everything. You know, you don't get alerts that you got an email. There's no dings from text messages. There's no Slack, you know, notifications popping up because otherwise it's really hard to focus. Um, and and the technique I use is I shut off a lot of apps and um, I have software called Pomodoro, which is like these sort of 20 or 25 minute total focus things. And then you get a five minute break. And so what I'll do is really completely focus for 20 minutes, no checking email, no, you know, whatever. Uh, and then launch apps, see what's going on, take a break. Maybe, you know, a couple times a day, I'll, I'll walk downtown and get a coffee you know, do something to get out of the house. But, um, you know, you find even as uh, technology creates a lot more ways to communicate, it becomes even more important to be able to focus. Uh, and at least for me on the software side of things, like that focus is everything. Like if I, if you can't do that, you just can't get your job done. Um, trying to think of other big changes. Obviously connectivity's gotten better. Like 
when I moved up here 20 years ago, um, I was able to get an ISDN connection, which was screaming at the time. And like, I was lucky to be able to do that. Uh, and, uh, and then we got DSL, like first, we were one of the first people in Nevada city to get DSL. Cause I ran into the installer guy downtown and told him, Hey, I'd really like to get it. And he's like, well, okay, we'll wire you up. Like it's, that's what I love about small town. Um, and you know, now we've got 650 megabit at my house. So, you know, it's, if, if, if you're reasonably close to like downtown Nevada city, um, connectivity isn't really the issue anymore. Um, you know, obviously there's other changes, uh, you know, COVID's brought changes because one of my go-tos for working remote to people was you still have to stay connected. Like, even if you're, you know, great, you can move up to the foothills, you're in this beautiful community, but at some point you're going to have to get another job. Even if you have a full-time job, if it's not a gig, that job is going to change. It's going to go away. You're going to want to change. You have to be ready for that. And that means you have to constantly put, it's like a cultivating a garden. You have to put time into your connections, your LinkedIn profile, your, you know, even your knowledge, like that's a big one. Um, but what I used to tell people is once a month, go to a meetup in Sacramento or San Francisco or somewhere in the Bay Area, like do that, force yourself to get out of the home office and out of your local community and someplace where you can engage with people, create new connections, you know, just, and especially give a talk. Like there are lots and lots of places where if you, you know, everybody knows something you don't know and you know something that other people don't know. So if you actually get out there and give a talk, it's a great way to build that connection network that you're gonna need. Like you are gonna need that at some point in your, in your career if you're working remote. And if you don't have it, it's, uh, it can be a scary thing. If you're like, you know, there's a reorg and suddenly you're like, I'm that weird person, you know, like out in the middle of nowhere, what's gonna happen to me? You can't, you can't be afraid of that, which means, you know, you've gotta constantly put the time in. Um, and it's easy to fall behind on technology. Like for me as a technologist, you got to constantly be reinventing yourself. Like technologies keep changing and, you know, it's, you have to invest in education on your own, like online classes, which are way easier now, uh, you know, just whatever to try new things. So that again, it's about sort of being able to market yourself for the thing that happens next, whatever that is, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, you know, you have to be ready for that. So I don't know, that in a nutshell is kind of like uh, my, my rules for working remote and a little bit of how things, uh, things have changed. Yeah. I mean, it's easier now. It's definitely a great time to, to, to be in a position to work remote compared well, you're to- You're me with an excellent segue here over to Danielle too. Um, and Danielle worked for uh, Traitware who was actually Tech Connections uh, office suite mates just down the hall from us. And uh, you saw the transition in January pre-COVID uh, from in-person office to working remotely for them. And now you're working uh, remotely completely for Augmenter. Uh, so I'd love to hear a little bit about how that transition went for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, originally my home office was set up next to my husband, which I learned very quickly, was not a good idea. Um, he's actually been working remotely for 10 years. So I had somebody to kind of like copy what he was doing and kind of set up my space. Um, so that was nice, but it was a little rough in the beginning. I don't, I wasn't fully expecting the number of distractions around the house. Um, you know, my husband has had 10 years of creating his own patterns of life. And suddenly I was thrown into that, which was harder to deal with than actually going remote. Um, I mean, I'm usually pretty good about just chatting with people on Slack and Teams. And I'm always the one that's reaching out to people like, how are we doing? How's everybody? Um, and, you know, we had, we already had um, my supervisor was already remote. So we were already doing calls over Slack every Monday. Um, and then when we all went remote, he added another one on Friday that was just kind of like a checking in more fun type of thing. So it wasn't just so much stress of like, you're sitting alone in a room by yourself all day. And maybe somebody from your family will come and bother you or your cat will <laughs> come and stick his face in yours. Or, you know, there's all these things that where 
you lose the boundaries of what is my workspace and what is my home space. Um, so kind of trying to figure out how to set those. And I had to be very clear with my husband, you know, like if my door is closed or if I have my headset on, I'm probably on a meeting. So that's not a time to come tell me about a deer outside. Um, and, you know, just those little things. And it, it was, I mean, I was okay with it. And my transition with Augmenter, they do meetings every single day. We do every morning check-in which I thought was going to be more exhausting, but it's actually really nice to just see them every day. You know, I've never met, I've met two of them in person and I haven't met any of the rest of them. And being able to kind of build that relationship that way every single day, even if it's just those 30 minutes is really nice. You know, you come in and um, you don't have to worry about are they going to like me? Am I going to like this person? You know, I never talked to them. Are they going to care that I exist here? It was just, you know, I came in, you look at all of each other's faces every day. You kind of get to know them that way. And it was really nice. And, you know, I, I'm i really impressed with what we can do with technology now. Um, it's not so isolating, even though a lot of us tend to have a tendency to use our technology to isolate ourselves from the world. <laughs> We're also very much involved in everything that's happening. Um, and so, you know, especially, you know, I'm technically a millennial, um, I'm like right on the edge, we don't worry about that. But, you know, I'm in that, that age of technology is part of who I am. And I grew up with that. And you know, I'm exposed to it every day and seeing all these different ways we can do things and kind of teaching future generations these things and teaching our past generations other things and just kind of bringing it together and finding this happy medium where we can all kind of work together to create this happy, cohesive, inviting space where we can be remote and not have to worry about feeling alone or feeling separated from your coworkers. Um, yeah, but it's been, it's been a pretty smooth transition overall for me. Awesome. So how did uh, joining Augmenter uh, happen and how was the recruitment process uh, without, you know, an office or, uh, you know, in person? Or... Yeah, so they were um, our next door neighbor in <laughs> the new Mohawk building and then they moved out to get a bigger space um, and I had actually talked to them quite frequently and played with all of their toys and was like what are you guys doing what's this and um, they were actually the ones that reached out to me in July um, and they were like hey you looking to change jobs and I was like oh well yeah I guess um, and you know I was not to speak ill, but I was getting burnt out with what I was doing at Traitware just because we were so small and I kept taking on more and more jobs because I have a bad habit of saying no. <laughs> um, so, you know, I burnt myself out and they gave me this opportunity to kind of refresh myself, especially in this time of COVID where, I mean, life is exhausting. It's exhausting to go outside. It's exhausting to go shopping. You know, I don't want to go outside and try and fight with somebody to do something. And, you know, so it was, it was a really nice opportunity that came at a really nice time for me. Um, and I really appreciated it. And, but yeah, I think a lot of it is those connections that you build. You know, I talked to Janet constantly and, you know, she kind of talked to Augmenter and they were like, how's Danielle doing? And it, then it came back to me. And um, so those connections that you build within your own community can reach so far, um, you know, and I have other people that worked in that building doing one thing or another that have gone off to different jobs, the Bay Area, different places. And now my reach through them has gone further. And, you know, it's really helpful to have that. So, yeah, I think just keeping those connections and then finding connections through those people and making sure not to lose them is beneficial to everything. Very cool. Very cool. And just so cool to hear how, how the Tech Hub uh, 104 New Mohawk Road has uh, really connected a lot of folks over the years. Now, 
connection is one of those things that if you're working remotely, you're going to be in constant communication. You were saying you've got meetings constantly with management. I'd like to turn back to Robert here to talk a little bit about how to really go best about staying in communication, involving HR, not being that isolated worker. And if they're talking about bringing you back into the office, how can you talk them into not bringing you back into the office? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I guess it starts with figuring out what you want. You know, what's the world you want to create for yourself? And so that, you know, some people like, well, I'd, I'd like to go back two days a week. So there might, you know, you have to know what you want to ask for. Um, and I think that uh, some of the, you know, the, the fact that you're a remote worker means that you're employed by some entity, right? I mean, there's contractors or whatever can also work remotely, but that's to have a boss and an HR department to report to. Uh, they're control freaks. A lot of them are control freaks and they want to manage you. And that is a paradigm that is being shifted and forced to be shifted. And so um, if people want to remote work, they can empower themselves to say, listen, this is how I see things. Let me look at what your policy is now. This is what I'd like. Um, there's all, you know, this is how I can um, satisfy your need to make sure I'm being productive and deliver deliverables. And yes, there might be certain things that I can't do remotely, but I've been proactive and I could see this need that I've heard you complain about a bunch of times, but I'd be happy to do that. That would, I could definitely do that. So I can't do that, but I could do this. And instead of saying like, I will do that report, I will code that VR software by December, whatever, you just break it down into little chunks and have regular communication with them. Um, I like the hearing about the Friday meetups. I see that happening a lot. Um, I think that that's really a good thing. But I guess my main message is if you want to become a remote worker, know what you want and figure out how you're going to get that while satisfying the bean counters, while satisfying HR. Well, what, we need a sign, sign time card and how are we going to Prove this. Oh, well, we can use PDF and, and we can acrobat it and we can have an official signature, you know, let the technology do the work and figure out how to be preemptive. And then, so there's, how am I as a worker going to communicate to you? So, you know, you can still feel like you're a control freak. <laughs> and, not, you know, one thing is like trust, you have to build up trust. So, I'm being a little harsh on employers, but I can because I can. <laughs> um, so the trust is really important. Um, saying here's how my work is going to be, lay out how the work is gonna be. But then there's also things to satisfy as far as um, like, hey, I have a laptop and if there's a mega fire, I'm going to protect your property, which is my work product. I will, you know, have this security system on my, I will back up to the cloud. I will, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot of angles that you have to satisfy. Um, and then there of course is, you don't have to pay for office space. You don't have to pay for you know, me being there, it will actually save you money. And by the way, and there's all these studies about increase in productivity, uh, it's gonna be much better for you. So, and if you still sense a lot of resistance, say, uh, how about we try it for a month and just see how it goes. Um, people, especially like if you're a programmer, they're going to be quaking in their boots that you're going to walk. Like the, there are certain jobs you, you know, 
and it's your life. You can find another job. So I think coming into it with, this is what I want. This is what I'm going to ask for. I have some compromise, but I've thought of this through and communication, getting back to your question about communication. That's totally essential. I uh, advise breaking up jobs into smaller chunks, making sure you do what you say you're gonna do, and then go back to the supervisor and say, see, it's Thursday at noon, here you go. Or it's Thursday at noon, and remember when you added those bricks on my shoulder and I said, yeah, but I can't do it all, but you know, I'll have to be late on Thursday, that's why this isn't done. You know, so you do have to be a little bit more meticulous and more, um, yeah, like keep track of things a little bit better about you said what, how this all went down. Um, Very cool. Yeah, that's, that's my yeah. point. We've addressed a little bit from the side of, you know, what is the worker need to ask the, the management, the HR department. I'm going to shift uh, to Ken here. Um, Ken, you've uh, run run businesses remotely over the years, and you've got some folks that do work for you. What is it? Uh, what does it take to properly manage them and, and get the most productivity? Um, I mean, I'll be honest. I'm not much of a manager. Like, I got very, <laughs> I have very little interest in, uh, you know, uh, regular updates on what you're, somebody's doing on a day by day basis. So the real challenge is finding somebody who fits with what I like. So, you know, what Robert's talking about, figure out what you want. So what I wanted is a company where I had people that could independently work on things and we could do like a once a week check-in and that was fine. And everybody just trusts everybody's going to do what they say they're going to do. And it just works. And given that it's a consulting business that, you know, we have this highly variable income stream. I'm not guaranteeing I'm going to be out there, you know, flogging the streets uh, to ensure, you know, 150% capacity utilization every single month, uh, which means you want to find people who are also like, yeah, I'll work hard this month and the next month half time essentially is fine. Uh, if you can find people who are okay with that and want that flexibility and also have the experience and the maturity so that they can work in an environment where everybody's sort of a free agent with responsibilities, then it's great. But finding those people is the hard part. And especially it's really hard in the Bay area. Um, and one of the reasons why in the Bay area is everybody's got a huge mortgage. There's none of this like, yeah, you know, next month I could, uh, I could, I could, you know, just take it off because I want to go do something except, you got a $10,000 mortgage payment to make, you know, so that doesn't work. Uh, so the people who work for me, there's a couple of people up here. There's a guy in Tokyo. There's a guy who's at a Buddhist retreat center over in Nevada. Like it's, you know, people who don't need that, you know, and, and I just, this is through connections, how I know people like that. Um, so that's challenging to try and find a team that works like that. The other issue is, uh, so I did a startup back in like 2005, 2006. And um, what's interesting is the VCers just, they actually thought I would do the startup here. Like they didn't think I would do it down in the Bay Area. But I'm like, I can't find like an enterprise software project manager with this background here. I mean, there are a lot of talented people here, but the pool is nothing like the pool in the Bay Area. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to find somebody who knows how to write Python parsers here. I mean, they might exist, but, you know, uh, probably not. Uh, so your, your pool is more limited if you're actually trying to do a startup or something here, uh, though there are incredibly talented people. I mean, some of the people I met, it was amazing. Um, and a lot of the people that live up here, they live up here because they're independent. Right. They're sort of like I, I said to Robert, there's kind of like they're cats, like you're like you're trying to hire cats. You know, it's like really hard because uh, one of the reasons they're up there is they're sort of free agents. A lot of them are like, well, I take jobs, I'm, I'm independent or whatever. And it's, you know, it was hard to build a VC backed company around that. So I wound up essentially having to do it in the Bay Area, which was rough because I was like, 
two years of halftime down there, halftime up here, take the train down on Monday mornings, take the train back Thursday nights. Uh, you know, so that was, that was, that was challenging. Um, but, you know, also I was in a space that was very specific, like a certain kind of programming space, right? It's a slice of a slice. So, you know, I shouldn't have been surprised that I couldn't find exactly the people I needed up here. I think there are a lot of things you could do up here, which is more general and you could find, you know, enough people to, to start a company here if I was going to do it again. Very cool. Now, Robert touched on this a little bit earlier. I think one of the real challenges that an employer may have when considering remote work is security. Uh, if you've got proprietary uh, software, <laughs> I know, Daniel, your company does some work for uh, the military. So, so what happens often is clients send me a laptop to use for their stuff. And so I've had like three laptops out here for like three different clients. Um, so, so, you know, and you get, you get, uh, you know, these things like your RSA key type things. There's a whole bunch of different versions of this. So, you know, you can make it work with some amount of pain and suffering. Uh, you know, anyway. Danielle, what's, uh, what's your experience been with uh, Maine Hume cybersecurity for the work you're doing? So we have certain projects that are, basically we can only have them locally, um, cannot live in any sort of cloud. And then we also have um, a VPN that runs through a server, which is actually hosted by one of it's our CTO. So he manages that. And then we have code that goes up there and basically he controls all of that. So if that one place goes down, then everything goes down. Um, so, you know, it's making sure that we are following the guidelines of what our customers and our clients are trying to do, which, you know, like Ken is saying, some of them are going to send you things that you can only use this. And some of them are going to be like, just make sure you're following these guidelines, staying inside of this box. So it really depends on kind of what work you're doing and who it's for and what the project is. Um, but I mean, mm, we all need to have better cybersecurity just in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are terrible with passwords. Um, I've seen so many that just make me very upset, but, you know, VPNs are a good way to at least put that extra layer of protection around yourself. You know, it makes it harder for someone to come try and hack you, especially when, you know, you're just working at home from your own store-bought router. You know, it's not everybody knows how to change the settings to the highest security, to change the passwords, to prevent other people from coming onto it. Um, and, you know, some jobs will teach you how to do that. Um, I had some knowledge in doing that. So I wasn't, you know, my job wasn't worried about it. Um, but not, you had all of these, basically these normal people having to go work from home and they had no idea what to do. You know, you have people in apartments that have shared routers that are set up somewhere that they have no control over. You have all these different situations where you have to try and find something that you can control within your own machine. Um, and VPNs are probably the best way to do that just for people to be able to have that sort of control of, I can at least protect this much of it. And then trying to work from within that VPN only and not, you know, straying out of it and like, oh, I'm going to start Googling over here outside of this and, you know, trying to keep that all contained. Now, Robert, in, in the co-working environment, this is also a concern. Do you find most people um, kind of handle it themselves or does Sierra Commons have any uh, non-standard practices that you guys like to embrace? Uh, no, I, I really feel like we provide a basic infrastructure and if people want to like, hey, can I, you know, do this security measure or that security measure, I give them access and they can do that. Of course, I need to make sure what they're doing is okay for everyone else, um, but that's that has not been a problem. Uh, some interesting things that have come up. One, we recently had a, a game developer um, here and they were, you know, old school and they're like, no one can see your screen. It's an open shared office environment. So, you know, they just kind of got 
some of that rice paper or screen stuff and create a little cubicle. But it was it was um, not easy to convince the employer to allow them to do co-working. Um, another situation which may also involve like in-home remote working as opposed to co-working is um, like HIPAA compliance if it's med medical work and um, phone conversations that need to be private and paperwork that needs to be under lock and key, things like that. You know, people can bring uh, under desk lockable cabinet. Um, and so we, we it's, it's kind of a slippery slope for Sierra Commons to say, we are providing your security. Yeah. You know, if you need security, we, you know, set it up. Um, but I would say that, you know, just the fact of working here in our, um, in our network, which is, does have some security on it, is way better than going to Starbucks and trying to just find the, any, you know, yeah, I'm a remote work, I'm a digital nomad and I'm, you know, working on highly sensitive material. It's not safe at Starbucks. So, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Now, we've, we've touched on this a little bit earlier in various segments. One of the things that I think people have real have, have had a challenge with during COVID is maintaining that productivity and kind of taking care of your own headspace so you're capable of being fully engaged in the work you're doing. Um, so, Love to start with um, hear from Danielle a little bit. You talked a little bit about that. Do you have any any further thoughts or, or insight into kind of how to really get in that zone? Yeah, uh, the biggest thing is setting a routine um, is with our cell phones and how easily available it is to access things like your email or whatever chat you're using for your work. You can just, you know, it's hard to just not fall into that. Oh, I'll just click this email and just see what that had to say. Um, so really setting those boundaries, like these are my hours. This is when I'm working, making sure that you actually take a lunch. Um, I am terrible at that. I was terrible at that in the office. Um, my husband's always like, let's go on a walk. Let's go outside the house. And I'm like, okay, we will go outside. Um, and that's, you know, making sure that you are stepping away and maybe, you know, if you need to, leaving your cell phone next to your computer so that you're not still trying to work when you're making your lunch or when you're going on this walk and it's supposed to be that time for you and making sure that you set those hard deadlines. Like, you know, this is my, I work until 4 p.m. I'm stopping at 4 p.m. Um, and making sure that you actually do stop. And, you know, sometimes I'll go over a little bit or if I took a longer lunch, I'll go a little longer, but really making sure that I have those times. So I started setting uh, like 30 minutes in the morning to just look at games on my phone or just hang out with the cats on the couch, in the dark, away from the computer, you know, just making sure that I have that moment of preparing myself to be ready for work. Because when you wake up, if you just start looking at emails, there can be something that upsets you. If you start looking at the news, there's probably gonna be something that upsets you. It's gonna affect how you're going into your work day. So really trying to make sure that you have a routine that allows you some sense of peace. Um, you know, every once in a while I'll do yoga in the morning, just something just to be mindful and kind of get within my own body to not feel the weight of everything happening in the world. Um, and I think that's super important, especially right now. I mean, even people going into the office, I think it's super important to have that before you're going and having to deal with whatever you're dealing, whatever, you know, all these things in the world, it for a while felt like there was no reprieve from it. Like you would stop working and then all of a sudden you'd be worrying about all these other things. And, you know, for me, especially there was a struggle for a while and, um, I mean, I struggle with my mental health and I see a therapist and I love it. Like, it's great to know that I have that to fall onto because sometimes I get lost in my own head and it's not something that's easy to pull out of. So, you know, find those things, find what's good for your own mental health, whether, you know, I'm going to draw a picture today or I'm going to write, you know, just finding something that can pull you back to your own sense of self so that you feel rejuvenated when you actually do go to work 
and then you can focus rather than feeling like I just need to relax. I don't know how to relax. And then you stop working and you're still stressed. Um, giving yourself that moment to reset so that you can start the day again and then you can actually focus and then you can feel better because you were focused. Um, I think those are kind of my most important points. That was awesome. Thanks, Danielle. Yeah. Uh, we'll turn, turn to Ken there. Um, you've talked a little bit about how your workflow, you know, some months you're going to be busier and some you're not. How do you maintain that productive focus in those months when you're less busy and, and you have to, you know, shift into work mode less frequently? Well, <laughs> uh, my wife would say, I'm always busy. It's just whether I'm getting paid for being busy or not. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, we just finished building, like this is part of a new house uh, that we, you know, built and moved into and just sold our other house. So, you know, even when it's months that I'm not doing as many billable hours, um, I feel like I'm putting in full days. I'm not, there's no hanging out on the hammock, reading a book time, unless we intentionally go on vacation. I, you know, it's just, it's just, there's just too much to do around the house. It's like, uh, it's kind of like what Danielle was talking about. Like when you work at home, you, everywhere you look, there's something to be done. And it's, you know, if it's not work, it's whatever, it's house stuff. Um, I love the thing. Yeah. Uh, that thing like about emails, that was a great point because I mean, that is one of my rules is like, don't check email after dinner because there's nothing good can come of this. Like, <laughs> like all it takes is that one gnarly email and it's just like, what happened to my beautiful evening? Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, kind of a part of me feels like I've been doing it for so long that the whole shifting of gears things is not a big deal for me. Um, yeah, uh, you know, the biggest challenge for me is that, yeah, it's kind of like, again, leaving the phone behind, like the fact that now we got all this great technology so we can be so connected all the time. And I kind of joke because we have lots of clients, right? So like for video chats, I've got Zoom, Skype, Slack, Blue Jeans, and I think a client using Google Meets or something, and I just did a Microsoft whatever thing that I've never done before. I got like I got eight ways to video chat, you know. Um, uh, it just you know it just feels like there's no place I could be where there's not a video chat thing that could happen, um, and and that sometimes is a kind of a weird feeling. I think that or that you know in general hurts my mental well being is that feeling sort of of always potentially being on, uh, which is why I love like living here. I, I do mountain bike rides. And there's no video chatting or, or even the possibility of that during a mountain bike ride. That just doesn't happen. Um, so, uh, and I love backpacking in the Sierras where there's no cell signal and you're just, you know, it's just completely off. And, and, I, and that becomes like a, an important thing, I think. Like that feeling like I re am really connect disconnected and I can, I can decompress, yeah. Well, I love the idea of having to get out of uh, communication to be able to, you know, be compressed. It's one of the th I think one of the things we all love about being up here is that there is that other world where it's not, you know, our home office, our co-working office. It's the woods, it's the mountains, it's the river. Um, love to hear a little bit from Robert, too, on, uh, on this angle of how to kind of maintain that productivity and work-life work balance. Cool, thanks. I, I would say totally I resonate with everything that's been said so far on the subject. Uh, one thing that uh, comes to mind is that activity is not does not equal productivity. And so there's all of this, you know, check this and do that and do this and do that. And what is it really to what end is there, you know? It's, really like there's there's something called like high payoff activity and low payoff activity and the low payoff activity is just like sometimes you just gotta stop for example like one of the things that i just recently started doing 
was I used Calendly, Calendly, can't say that right, but you know, it's a scheduling software. And at first I was worried about being off-putting where, oh, you want to schedule a meeting? Here's my calendar. And I just block out the time. And guess what? I am always unavailable on Mondays and Fridays. And those are the days that I work on my stuff and I don't feel that pressure of this. And, and of course that is a luxury. Not everyone that remote works can do that. But if you have an option of scheduling a meeting, like schedule it on these days and don't schedule it on these other days. Cause for me, I need that openness to just like work on things at my pace and what I want to do and not the interrupt driven. And, you know, it's hard to get off a scheduled meeting without scheduling another meeting with someone. And it just, snowballs and then you're like what what am i supposed to do all this work from the meetings and so um i'm list driven like if i um at the beginning of the day i'll try to do three or four things that i really really need to get done and that feels good to, to for me to check the list off and helps me prioritize you know why am i doing this right now and it's funny because some of the things that I find myself doing are low priority. And I'm just like sit and do these low priority things to avoid doing the high priority things. And I'm like, what the heck? So the list helps me catch myself doing that. Awesome. So I really like your, your idea of having no meeting days. That's uh seems like a great way to get out of that headspace of constantly zooming with other people in, in today's world. Of Yeah. And another benefit of that is strategically it's Monday and Friday. So what happened if on the Friday I don't have anything and the Monday I don't have anything, that looks like a four day weekend. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Now, I'm sure some some folks are, are are looking at that that shiny silver silver thing you're sitting in there. Oh and, yeah. Uh, just got to give you a chance to talk about that shift pod you're sh- you're sitting in there because it's uh it's just a cool idea. Yeah yeah. So this is look it up shift pod one word. Um, so Sierra Commons has uh, you know beginning in March we had great membership it was really thriving shut down closed. Closed, closed. Oh, you get to reopen. Okay, cool. Building up speed. Da, da, da. Shut down again. Ah. Oh, okay, you're open again. Uh, oh, the COVID is, you know, the numbers are increasing. Oh, we're going to go into red again. Ah, like, oh, how, how are we going to deal with this? Uh, one of the main, you know, yes, we provide community. Yes, we provide education. Yes, we provide mentoring. And when it comes right down to it, we provide awesome infrastructure and people that live in the woods that can't even get satellite uh, reliably um, need a place to work and connect. So um, experimenting with these shift pods, which are kind of geodesic dome shaped uh, tents, insulated tents. Uh, I got familiar with them at Burning Man. They can withstand huge winds, gale force winds, um, desert heat, they stay cool inside. And uh, I was thinking, oh, well, we'll just get our patio and get more rain covering and then get those propane heaters. And I'm like, yeah, the propane heaters are really hard to get. They're burning fuel all the time. Uh, Who's going to have to go refill those propane tanks? I am. I'm going to go refill the propane tanks. Um, And like, at what point do you create a tent where it's just like being... Is it outside or inside, like to weather the storms here? So getting a shift pod, uh, we're just experimenting with one. It's a cool uh, bubble. You can do your own work in. It's COVID friendly. You can rent it for the day. Uh, or we have a way of heating it, light it, and you can be outside in your cool little pod, get your work done, stay fairly comfortable, weather the storm and get your work done, stay connected. Cause some people, COVID or no COVID, they need to do business and they need to work. 
And if the, if the coffee shops are closed, they don't have internet, the library is closed, where are you gonna go? And so we wanna make sure that we are getting one like uh, one step ahead of what's happening. And so actually, if anyone wants to come to Sierra Commons, just uh, sierracommons.org and uh, you'll find a way to contact me, Robert Trent, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a little tour of the shift pod. I love, love, love feedback from people. I particularly appreciate the fact that you're trying to figure out a winter solution because I used to live on the backside of Banner. I had satellite internet and I could not do what I'm doing right now with, with that connection. It just would not have happened. Um, my wife uh, was, uh, you know, going stir crazy working from home until she wound up down at Sierra Commons. Uh, so I really appreciate that there's going, there's thought going behind how can we keep this going as the seasons change. Um, and I want to cycle back a little bit. Um, Danielle, you've got one of the uh, more unique uh, backgrounds here. Uh, talked a little bit via email about how you've been able to balance your work life with your artistic life a little bit better. Um, love to hear a, a few more thoughts from you on that. Yeah. Um, I mean, with COVID, it's kind of died down with performances, but at the very beginning, um, in, I think it was February, March, I was actually preparing to do a show and, um, you know, there would be days when we would have earlier rehearsals because that was the only time the space was open and being able to work from home it allowed me to shift my schedule, you know, whichever way. And, you know, I can just do those hours later uh, and then I could drive to where, wherever rehearsals were. Um, and it, it's very nice to not have to worry about choosing between my left and my right brain. Um, you know, being able to kind of blend the two and, and if I'm working on a piece or if I'm teaching a class, you know, I can use my lunchtime to do a private with gyrokinesis or um, I just performed at the studio I teach at um, and I was, you know, working on my solo during my lunchtime and, you know, after work and it was just, I'm already here. It doesn't feel like I have to take extra time. I don't have to you know, leave work, change my mindset, drive home, get home. Okay, well, now I'm home and I just want to relax. You know, I'm already here and it doesn't take that extra hour of my life to try and get into the mood to want to create art. You know, it just, it comes a lot more naturally and I feel like I have more time to do it and it's more, there's more freedom in it. Um, it's really nice to have that like, I didn't realize how much even just the 20 minute drive from where I used to work in the building to my house, like that 20 minute drive was, you know, there's somebody driving slow in front of me, there's somebody that cut me off, and now I get home and I'm angry. Um, and, you know, and then I get home and it's like, well, I should eat dinner, what am I going to make for, you know, it's all these things that start going through my mind. And when I'm working from home, it's, okay, I know I'm done it for, I have this hour to myself. And I can do these things before I have to start thinking about dinner. So I, ga I gained that whole hour to be able to nurture this part of myself. And it, I love it. <laughs> it's been super awesome. That's awesome. It kind of brings us back full circle to Robert's uh, point at the beginning where he's talking about how you're not spending the time driving down to Rockland, Louisville. You're not commuting. You're not burning that gas. You're in control of your time. Yeah. This has been an awesome, awesome conversation, guys. Uh, I'm going to throw one last question out there. It's kind of a closing question here, and it's a, it's a softball. Uh, I'm going to start with Ken. What's the best thing about living in Nevada County and working remotely? Um, so for me, it's... Uh, it's that I don't have to deal with traffic. Like traffic was the thing that would like, like worrying about when, like in the Bay area, I'm like, when do I have to leave this time to go here? When, and there'd be a vein in my head that I could feel <laughs> like just, and it just would ruin my whole day. And just not never, like I can ride my bike 
many places that I want to be in this area for shopping, for whatever. I just, that just makes a huge difference for me. That, yeah. What about, uh, what about you, Robert? It's the same, man. I, I came, I moved to the Nevada County from the Bay Area because I was driving, you know, from San Francisco to Silicon Valley in a, in a 64 Dodge Dart nonetheless. And it was just, it was, it was horrible. I just to spend the, like the primest time of my days sitting in a car. Um, and I, I live in Nevada City. And so it's, it's, Instead of that time, I can take a walk or be downtown. And like I ran into Ken earlier today and we just had a little conversation on the street. Awesome. You're not going to do that in a car. You're not going to be like, oh, there's someone I know next to me. Let's have a conversation. It's not going to happen. So it just, it's, it's quality of life, not spending time in a car. Excellent. Danielle, same, same softball question. So I actually grew up in Nevada City, um, and then I left for college and lived in Sacramento for seven years. Um, and then me and my husband were like, you know what, when we graduate, going back to the mountains, there's too many people here. <laughs> and I know Sacramento is not that big, but when you grow up in Nevada City, any other city outside of that is big. Um, so yeah, we wanted to come back to the smaller place and, you know, both of our families are here and kind of makes it easier and a little annoying sometimes, but, you know, just to have it all in one place and nature. I mean, that is really the biggest thing is having nature. And I feel like there's more of a sense of calm and just the people in general. Um, so if you do, yeah, if you go outside and see somebody on the street, chances are it's going to be a friendly conversation rather than feeling harassed or somebody being rude because they had a bad day or, you know, being stuck in traffic and all those fun things that everybody else said. <laughs> I, I do. Okay. So I'm going to bring up a point. There was a worldwide study of happiness where they're trying to figure out what is the common factors that make people happy. And the only thing that they could find that was consistent as a factor was the length of your commute. If your daily commute was less than an hour, so less than 30 minutes each way, you were significantly happier than if it was longer than that across all these countries, you know, uh, which I thought was really interesting. I mean, I think it's more like a proxy for, uh, for a lot of uh, other things, but yeah. So. This has been just awesome, guys. Uh, thanks once again, Ken Krugler, Robert Trent, Danielle Johnson. I'm David Carroll from the Nevada County Tech Connection. Thanks so much for joining us.